Paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. So after much arguing with technology, the show is finally not live, unfortunately. We were trying to do a live show tonight, but it didn't work out. The software that I wanted to use just introduced a whole lot of new complexity when it wasn't supposed to. Sucks. And that was the word you're looking for annoying. is sucks. I don't know about sucks. I used it for another test and it worked perfect. I don't know why it won't work for this show, but it wouldn't. So here we are. Ah, uh, anyway, I'm your host as usual, Nate. I've got Jason with me, and for our special guest for the night, we have DM. Say Thank hi. You for having me. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to chat a little bit about PowerShell on Linux. He reached out to us via Twitter, and he's uh, apparently passionate about PowerShell on Linux, <laughs> so we thought we'd have him on <laughs> chat about it. <laughs> so um, I figure uh, we may as well just get straight on into that, unless anybody has anything else they want to chat about first, like how much uh, light stream causes a bunch of headaches <laughs> for the past hour. <laughs> no, I've, I think we've spent the last hour chatting about that. <laughs> yeah, so we don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> So, okay, um, I guess as, as anyone who's watched anything in the, the technology news for like the past two years or so knows, Microsoft loves Linux now, right? So uh, one, of the, one of the things that they have ported over to Linux is PowerShell, and uh, DM is here to chat with us about PowerShell on Linux. So what, what kind of awesome stuff have you done on PowerShell on Linux that, you're so, uh, that you like it so much? Yeah, so the the PowerShellLinux.com website runs on PowerShell on a uh, Linux server. Okay. Uh, I'm. The, I think that one of the strengths of PowerShell, and especially for like uh, sysadmins, is uh, I, I feel it's like the duct tape. I look at it as like a duct tape that can connect different pieces of. Uh, uh, of things together, so um, I use I, I use it a lot to grab information from one system and kind of pipe pipe that uh, convert that information, filter that uh, information, and pipe it to another system. Um, I at, uh, in my day job I manage about uh, twenty thousand uh, VMs of all kinds, uh, shapes, and sizes, and uh, PowerShell is is for me the tool that uh, that allows me to to uh, take on uh, a challenge like that. It's uh, it, it's really good. It, it it was good for Windows systems from uh, I think many years, but uh, with the the open source project that Microsoft did uh, by open sourcing PowerShell, it it opened the the this powerful tool to be available for um you know mac right uh, so um <clears throat> maybe i'm i haven't used powershell much i'll be honest mm -hmm. because i don't manage yeah. a bunch of windows machines uh so when i think of powershell i think of you know managing your exchange server or managing your mm -hmm. windows server or uh you know integrating with azure um has it expanded beyond that is that is that why this is such a powerful tool now yeah, so um, the it, it's you you can definitely do all those things, but uh, because PowerShell is uh, unlike Bash, PowerShell is an object-oriented shell. So um, you so so it allows you to uh, work with different types of information. For example, uh, you can load a JSON file and. Uh, PowerShell has a simple command to convert that JSON file to a, to a PowerShell object. You can manipulate that object and spit it out as a JSON file, as an XML file. Um, so if you take something like that and you take like a tool like Terraform, which is, uh, it can talk to, uh, you know, you can use uh, Terraform use to create... To provision uh, clouds and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. To, to provision clouds or private clouds on DigitalOcean, yeah. on uh, VMware, on... Uh, so then you you can use PowerShell to generate your configuration files uh, for Terraform and then simplify, like, you can, uh, for example, I use a work to uh, query the... We have an IP management system for networking. 
So I use it to uh, grab IPs that are uh, free to provision new VMs. And then I create the JSON files for Terraform and I spin out the, the machines, for example. Or uh, so PowerShell. Sort of the- Sort of the glue between your <clears throat> IP management system and your cloud provisioning. Yeah, That's and uh, yeah, it's uh, or for example, you can you can use uh, PowerShell to remote, uh, so you can uh, remote from uh, uh, a Linux machine to uh, another Linux machine. Uh, so in the back end on uh, on, Lin- uh, on Linux and uh, Mac, PowerShell uses SSH to do the remoting. Okay. Um, so it allows you to to uh, easily like remote to uh, to another server, run commands, get in, get information from there. Like programmatically, uh, you mean? Not, yeah. Uh-huh. Not like I've got a shell, I go do the thing, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Programmatically, you can script it out. You can um, uh, like you can run a command on your shell, on your box, and get information from like a remote system. Okay. Or uh, you can run it in parallelism, uh, which is a feature they uh, added. They re- added to PowerShell seven. That's uh, in RC right now, but it's going to be a. Uh, it, it had some form of uh, parallelism before, but they simplified the process. Okay, uh, so it sounds like you can manage your Linux boxes through PowerShell as well. Yeah, it's uh, another thing I really like about it is the. Uh, I think the the at, at least for me, um, some people you know prefer Bash, but at least for me, it's much easier to when I use PowerShell to uh, find strings within a file or to use regex to replace uh, uh, you know strings in a file. Or uh, PowerShell get, even has a, a command to uh, kind of format. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say configuration files, but uh, Files with a specific uh, text file with specific tr- structures. Okay. So it really helps to like, uh, let's say in Linux you have the Etsy OS releases file. Mm-hmm. So it's really easy for you to parse that file with PowerShell and you know figure out what OS you're running or, uh, and maybe do certain things based on the OS. Like if it's Ubuntu, do one thing. Like right, use, right. To figure out what it like is. That. Yeah. You know, and then and then <clears throat> act on it accordingly. So. Um, <laughs> In a lot of ways, though, Ansible and things like Ansible will do that as well. Um, do you have any experience with Ansible? Like, do you have any comparison yeah, yeah. between the two, or is one good at one thing and one good at the other, or is it just pick yes. the poison? <laughs> yeah. So I, I I feel like Ansible is more for state configuration, mm-hmm. and uh, but it's not like a scripting language, and you're limited with uh, I forgot what they call it, like but the modules that Ansible has. Mm-hmm. And also in the back end to configure Windows systems, Ansible uh, Ansible uses uh, PowerShell and Windows, for example. Okay. Uh, but but I can give you like one example uh, where Ansible wouldn't work, and uh, like let's say PowerShell worked for me. So I have to deploy uh, this simulator for a storage system of a really big vendor. So they have this, but the problem with the, so they give you like an OVA file and when you deploy it, uh, this virtual machine, uh, you can't connect to it. It's, it's kind of stuck in this boot loop and you have to press this key config, like press like control something. And then it it has like this old, you know, menu where you press one to initialize the failure and then you could press all kinds, and then it starts asking you questions. What's the, like what's the IP? What's the, you know, all kinds of like information, and only then you can st- like the the filer gets a network stack, and you can actually connect to it. So using, uh, so I had to syst- We have a lot of these filers, and I had to systematically deploy it. And okay. um, so I used PowerShell to uh, deploy this to to connect to the, the virtualized system and deploy this file, uh, this this VM, and after that. I used PowerShell to uh, continuously uh, take screenshots of this VM and and uh, uh, run it through like an OCR uh, tool to to figure out what words are on the screen. 
And, Sounds <laughs> and, like an interesting and, way to handle a problem. <laughs> yeah, and then when exactly, but the, like this vendor, it, because they have it's a it's a simulator. It's not like it's not for production, but yeah. we develop stuff for this for this uh, device. So and we have you know hundreds of developers, and they need that in their labs. We didn't have any other way to do it. Sure. So then, uh, so then, based on the stuff on the screen, I I would send the keyboard uh, strokes to the VM, configure the network stack, and then I could use something like Ansible to continue the configuration. But to so so that's why I mean like it's as I said earlier, it's like the glue. It 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 allows you to do stuff that um, that any like a programming language would allow you to do in a simpler way because it has a lot of stuff already built into it. And it, oh, and, so, and, I mean, and, and yeah, go ahead. No, it sounds like you used it like, like an expect script for that, that particular instance. Yeah. It's like, uh, you, you I, I could have also used Python, but what I like about PowerShell is that it's, uh, it's not an, it doesn't work like an, it, it, it I mean, it's a shell and an interpreter in one. And be, and also because it's built on the on the uh, .NET and uh, .NET Core for the cross-platform side of things, I'm I have access to a lot of .NET uh, stuff behind the scene if I need to use it. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like you can get pretty deep into PowerShell. Um, does using PowerShell to this level, I'd assume it would mean that you'd need to practically be a programmer. So that's another thing that like it sounds like it, but uh, y you need to understand like the a lot of uh, like the the way the language works. But I, but as uh, my background is uh, is just admin, I wasn't a programmer. Okay. But the way I I started with PowerShell is uh, I worked for a big uh, U.S. insurance company that probably everybody heard of. And uh, they used to hire like 30 or 40 people a week to be their sales uh, insurance agents. And if they didn't pass their tests um, to their to sell insurance, they would like fire half of them. And I spent like, I started working there and I spent hours on end creating users, deleting users, creating users, deleting users, like, <clears throat> and... High turnover I, rate. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so then I started looking at like, what's the best way to, to, to do it? So then I looked at VBScript, and VBScript was like you needed to really be a programmer to yeah. be able to do stuff with it. And that's how I got into PowerShell. Like PowerShell is really good at um, like importing CSV file and iterating on them and stuff like that. So like I created, uh, I wasn't a programmer. I didn't really have much of a background with it. And I created a script that created, if, if creating a user with all kinds of stuff took like almost 30 minutes because there were a lot of, specific stuff in the in the user configuration to depending on where they sell insurance stuff like that in powershell it allowed me to do it very very quickly without a much much experience like and a lot of it was like uh, i take a command that creates a user and i could just type it in you know in the shell like so you can you can what i what i what i like about powershell is that it it's it has it's simple for certain things, and then it's like the, the the learning curve, like how much you can do with it, is insane. So like you you start by running, you know, it's the same thing. It's running like a command that gives you like ls or something like that, and sure. then you you the, you you grow into it. So like so you do you find a command that does one thing, and then you can connect it with another command that does another thing, and then like slowly but surely you have this very powerful thing that can save you a lot of time hmm. <clears throat> yeah it's it i mean it it does have there's a lot of functionality built into it um, mm -hmm. um i have to use it for work as well i'm not not particularly a fan of it um i find it very long-winded um i did but, notice but, the the little bit of mean? powershell i've done uh, a lot of the commands are very very um character intensive <laughs> yes <laughs> i'll put yes. it that it's way pretty much but it, so, Microsoft's Microsoft's uh, uh, all their different frameworks the same way. They they spell everything out to like ad nauseum. Yeah, so. we're we're bash. Every single command is like five characters or less. <laughs> yeah. So so the 
I know what you mean. Like uh, I had somebody was telling me like it's very verbose, which is it, it's a good and a bad thing. So like if you come to read a so for example, somebody came to my uh, partial Linux Telegram group and he needed like some help with a bash script, and it's very. It, I mean, if it's a lot harder if you take somebody else's bash script and you try to figure out what it's doing. That's where like the the verbose and the long commands actually help you out. But, yeah, I guess uh, uh, it's <clears throat> it's hard to. Uh... There's a little bit of the mystery gone when the when mm -hmm. the when the commands are not two characters that you have to yeah. know what they are in order to know what they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, the... so so somebody came to a PowerShell group for help with their Bash script. Yeah. So I feel like, like, I, I feel like I he mean, screwed up to begin with. <laughs> no, he no he he needed help converting a Bash script to a PowerShell script. Okay. Or uh, I think for something for Windows or something like that. But uh, I mean. Like I try to help anybody that you know needs like the 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 Telegram group was called PowerShell and Linux, but like if you have uh, you know Windows PowerShell question or a Mac PowerShell question, like well, everybody there is really nice and will try to help you out, uh, myself included. But uh, uh, back to your long-winded commands, a lot of the commands have like aliases and shortcuts. Hmm. So like if you have like uh, I don't know. Uh, get child item which is the equivalent of uh ls then you can use gci does the same thing and also another cool thing is that you can use uh bash commands and linux commands inside powershell on on linux so you could do ls capture the output to like a variable and hmm. uh, so, like yeah and so, some something some yeah. commands work yeah and then you get then you get like uh, oh in, in, cool Linux command works and then nothing works because now you're trying all the commands then and you it start using them together. and then you find the ones that yeah. don't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean obviously if you use ls you're not going to get like an object back. So it's uh so you lose like you get text back which uh you lose some of the magic because uh, you'd have to parse instead of Yeah, exactly. do you know deal with it <clears throat> as an object. Yeah. But uh for example, like uh, it, it's a lot easier. For example, I I, ha I needed a script uh, that modifies the somebody copied uh, files and they they didn't copy they copied a lot of data, but they didn't copy the timestamps. So it was very easy to like read all the files and com and compare the lists and just change the timestamp because. Uh, in in PowerShell, like every file, like you get the file object, and then you do like dot last write date equal whatever the time did you want or the time did you read from like the source file or stuff like that. So I didn't have to copy all the files; I could just easily manipulate the date on the files um, and stuff like that. Like it's uh, <clears throat> it's I think it's really nice that you can run uh, step by step commands. But I also I also see the problem with like, especially people with a lot of years of experience in Bash. Like I I yeah, right. <laughs> I, I even I even had people say like, oh, I don't like the object kind. Like, you know, I don't like working object. I like parsing text. I just think you know it's for. I mean, it, it depends on kind of like the way your mind works. Yeah. Like yeah. if you so if, parsing <laughs> parsing text is, in my opinion anyway, <laughs> it's just simpler. Right. Yeah. You have text. It's predictable, kind of. <laughs> the way you deal with it is predictable. Yeah. Um, I have, I mean, I, I don't do a lot of programming. I don't do a lot of object-oriented anything. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the few times that I've had to deal with things that were, were formed like an object, I found it to be difficult. However, yeah. I will fully admit that that is my own shortcoming. It's not because it's the wrong way to do it. It's just a new way for me, and I haven't had to deal with it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can see both sides of the argument, uh, an object I would expect to be a little more predictable, um, or a little more structured. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the, the nice thing about when you, like when you when you have objects and you have object types, there's certain things that come with like, uh, an object type that the language gives you. For example, like a string has all kinds of 
uh, functions or methods. For example, like if you have a string, it's really easy to convert it to like uppercase, lowercase, uh, stuff like that. That that it's sure. it's much harder to do with like other um, because it's 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 something you inherit from the fact that it's a string or uh, yeah. I mean, Python <clears throat> handles strings in the same way, doesn't it, Jason? Yeah, yeah PowerShell is oh, also object oriented. Well. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so. um, I, I I mean I. I think uh, I don't think one is worse than the other or better than the other. I just think it's like another way of thinking. Yeah. And uh, and and also Bash is good. Like I'm not saying, uh, you know, like it it's it's been working for years and many people like it. I it, it just for me I find it like a lot easier to work with uh, with like the objects. To for example, I I wanted to archive uh, a podcast. And it's like really easy in in PowerShell to like to to use something like uh, invoke uh, rest method, give it like the URL to the podcast, and you just get an object of all the podcast and like the and it automatically structures the data for you. So you get an object that has like the pod, the episode name, the URL for the you know for the for the episode, like all the uh, metadata, like in one command that. You know, if you use curl and you just get a bunch of text and you have to yeah. parse it. <clears throat> I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there's also, um, there's a certain amount of um, wizardry, I guess you could call it, <laughs> involved <laughs> in parsing output from plain text. You know, and yeah. that's it, it, that's probably another thing that, that people are having trouble letting go of because that's a skill. Like that, that's a it, thing it that people have it's developed. It's an amazing skill, yeah. Yeah, it's a thing that, <laughs> that people that have been at a command line for long enough have figured out and developed. And uh, to say, oh yeah, that thing that you've spent 20 years building, we don't need it anymore. <laughs> that's going to make people feel uh, a little threatened, I think. <laughs> yeah, so 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 my my mindset is not is not that. Like, I think if if I think and 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 I think I'm I'm not trying to like convert. Uh, like let's say the gray beards of uh, beard's not you know gray. like the people the the people yeah exactly <laughs> the people that have like years of experience and and use what they uh, what they know and it works for them uh, great I just yeah, think sure. there's a, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of people that get into this field um, you know like a lot of uh, new people that get into like sysadmin work or DevOps or Stuff like that. And I think PowerShell is like a really, uh, a really powerful tool uh, for them to get started. And uh, I also, I also like that you can. Uh, not everything is transferable yet because the Windows PowerShell and the PowerShell Core slash uh, cross-platform version of PowerShell they are still a little bit different. And and Microsoft is working on on eventually with PowerShell Seven, like to to bridge that gap but it's it, it's really nice that you learn something with and it and it's cross-platform and you can take it between the, um, the operating systems and if uh, you know you can try things on your mac and then take it to your linux box and, and a lot sure. of stuff stays the same <clears throat> so i mean yeah it's, i don't i don't imagine that you're ever going to see bash get replaced by powershell on a linux command prompt if if uh, you know that's kind of where <laughs> the conversation was going <laughs> yeah um, but to the same point, some people, you know, you, you just have to realize that there's sometimes a better way to handle a thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. And um, it, it it's also the, I think one of the strengths that PowerShell has is that it has like a lot of modules that extends this functionality. So um, there are modules to manage, uh, you know, you said earlier Azure, there are modules to manage like AWS, Google, um, like uh, Google Apps. You have modules to manage like FreeNAS boxes, NetApp. Uh, so like, it it's also works as a very nice abstraction layer. So for example, like you, if you know PowerShell, and now somebody tells you like, oh, is this FreeNAS box? Go manage it. Then you can uh, you you don't know you don't have much in experience and you can install the FreeNAS module, 
use like the command to connect to whatever the your free nest box using like a username and password and then you can use like powershell modules to get like uh, so sorry powershell command lists to get the uh, the volumes that you have and get information about them and look at the sizes and stuff like that so you don't really need to know free nest for example or i uh, or there's like modules for um, i think uh almost every virtualization platform. Um, How about Red Hat I, Enterprise Virtualization? Yeah, KVM and stuff like that. Ah, really? Uh, I'm surprised. I'm Nobody supports uh, Rev. <laughs> I actually, yeah, like why? I, I use I use, um, I use PowerShell to manage uh, like uh, uh, rel systems to configure like uh, uh, Samba and join, it to, join them to the to Active Directory domains in some of the labs that we have and stuff like that. Like, um, so it's I, so, so like the, uh, there's a, I, I've seen a few people talk about like how if 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 like the module doesn't exist usually uh, the community will step up and try to you know to to bake one. I've been. I've been busy since like the last month or so, but I started working on like a, a next cloud module to manage hmm. like next cloud users and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. And yeah. And, and a lot of these uh, modules are open source, which is also a great thing. Yeah, that is a good um, thing. And uh, so I, I think like if you invest in this language, you get more uh, like you, you, you get a lot more than, than you, you know, uh, than than just the language, sure. Because the the you you get all the extensibility that comes uh, that 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 comes with it. And uh, for I can give you like another example that I used it. There's uh, do you do you guys know uh, the Selenium uh, test suite? Do you know what it is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so um, this one guy, uh, his name is Adam Driscoll. Uh, he created this uh, Selenium PowerShell module, and um, it, I, I needed to do some uh, to get from one of the vendors we work with. Like the, we have over like a hundred and something accounts with them, and this, they don't have an API, unfortunately. And I and I was tasked with like uh, getting some uh, billing information from all these like hundreds of accounts, and uh, <laughs> so so I so I found his module. And then, uh, and, I, and and what it does, it allows you to like spin out a Chrome browser or Firefox browser, and just you type commands in PowerShell, and it drives your browser. So like, oh, <laughs> go to this URL, That's find this, cool. yeah, find this link. So you have like you know, kind of like the same as like a bash command that controls your Chrome or your Firefox. Uh, but at the time, this module didn't uh, work on Linux and and Mac, so I ported it like. Uh, I ported the thing and then to to the module. I pushed the code to. I, I made a pull request. He merged it, so now it works on on. Uh, so I can use it on my Linux box at work, hmm. and I can just I can I and and I made like a simple like for each loop. I read like a CSV file with all the the login information, and I I grab the so it logs so it oh it spins like a browser goes to. Um, like the right URL, click a few things, gets like the 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 PDF uh, billing information, saves it to a file, puts it somewhere, and then at the end it creates like a zip file and emails it to somebody that needs it. <clears throat> cool. uh, so, so like, yeah, go ahead. I don't want to <clears throat> cut you off because you were on a roll, yeah. but I was I was curious. You mentioned earlier um, PowerShell on Linux dot com. I said it's okay. it's it's your own website, right? Yeah. Uh huh. You said it runs on PowerShell on Linux. I'm I'm curious if you could unpack that a little bit. Like, what role does PowerShell play in actually running the website? Like, I wouldn't say that my website runs on Bash on Linux. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> so, um, so the same guy that made the Selenium module, he created the um, a framework that it's called the uh, uh, Universal Dashboard. And the uh, Universal Dashboard is uh, is a PowerShell module. Uh, they have a community version that's open source, and then like an enterprise version that has like a few extra features. But uh, 
the whole module because it's uh, because PowerShell has access to .NET and stuff like that. Um, so the module, when when you like, you have a uh, you can build like your whole website in uh, using this module, and then it creates its own web server and hmm. present that website, and uh, you can. <clears throat> Uh, and there's other modules that the community made and, and like a bunch of stuff that like, uh, extends its functionality. And because it's built with PowerShell, like I can, for example, uh, get like a, you know, parse, uh, a file in Linux and, and, and based like, you know, based on like the information in the file, modify the website accordingly. And, uh, it has like a lot of functionality you create like you can create like scheduled jobs within the uh, the the dashboard to to do all kinds of you know run bash commands if you want like go grab something from somewhere modify it present it on the site uh all kinds of like really it's very it's like very powerful and i think i know like five percent of it <laughs> so your your site is literally running in PowerShell. <laughs> yeah. So there's uh there's an Nginx uh server in front of it. Okay. And the only thing it does is uh because I didn't want to run it uh the dashboard as root. Okay. So the only thing it does is uh it it creates like a redirection between like the uh, port 80 and 443 right. to like the high ports, so you don't need root to run. Yeah, and I mean, site. you you may not <clears throat> want to expose your server directly to the internet anyway, yeah. just because mm -hmm. it's good practice. So yeah, exactly. But um, other than that, like I, uh, for example, I I was lazy. I didn't want to. I didn't want to write like a lot of HTML or not a, not a lot of HTML because the dashboard does a lot of stuff for you. But uh, I wanted to use Markdown to write some of the pages. And I found like this module that uh, one of the guys in the community, funny enough, is like in Israel. So we started talking about it. But uh, he made like a module that converts Markdown to the dashboard language, <laughs> for example. So like I can write pages in Markdown. I could, I like you could use it to make a blog. The the I made like using this dashboard uh, uh, framework. I made the a map for another podcast that. Uh, like puts points based on information, yeah, location you were showing information. Us that the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, but so it's all like it's it's all it's it's funny enough, but it's like PowerShell runs this this site, which which is another thing that shows like yeah, Python like Python for example can run web servers, mm -hmm. but Bash can't because of like the the kind of like the the object oriented the uh, side of thing gives it like more power right? i mean the the methodology behind bash though is such that everything is supposed to be very small and purpose built and mm -hmm. it sounds like yeah. PowerShell is kind of the exact opposite it's meant to be exactly. the swiss army knife where <laughs> where bash is <laughs> bash is meant to be the screwdriver <laughs> yeah and um it's it's a it's another nice thing that uh Somebody in the community created a module that does like the that imports like the bash completion to yeah. to PowerShell for like Unix systems, and then um, like I really like how the fish the fish shell in in Linux work and the command line uh, completion and then prediction I guess uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but uh, yeah I'm the, I think <clears throat> fish started on I thought that started on Mac actually. That, yeah, there's a possibility. I don't know much about the origin of it, but uh, I actually I played around with it because I I just like to know how things work. You know, I like to tinker whatever anything and everything. But uh, so, and then I suggested to like one of the Microsoft guys that I know. Oh, it'd be cool to like if pa pa PowerShell could do that. And then like oh, there's there's uh, apparently there's like already like an issue on GitHub for that somebody made. Hey. How about like adding this functionality to PowerShell? And um, I think since it was open source, I think they they published the stats. But like a lot of the a lot of the stuff, um, a lot of the new code that PowerShell has comes from the community, and I think it, that's that's also really great. Um, 
I think what I what I like <clears throat> about most of what I've heard tonight is that this tool that Microsoft baked uh, has become something a lot more than just a Microsoft tool since they open sourced it. Yeah, and 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 I think that's why like a lot of people saying this and joke around about this whole Microsoft hard Linux. And I was, I think I used to be one of those people because I've been running Linux for many years. But uh, the, I, because in, in, you know, in enterprises, sometimes you have to run Windows and this like PowerShell was mm -hmm. the thing that, that gave me this scripting, this power, um, this uh, in Windows. And I learned to appreciate that power. And now it kind of bleeds into this to to like all the Linux stuff, and and I personally like it more than the, the alternative. So I mean, some um, some of us can remember Steve Ballmer on stage calling Microsoft yeah. or calling Linux a cancer, right? So yeah, it's it's kind of there's a little bit of bad blood there, but <laughs> yeah. but uh, but yeah, Microsoft has definitely changed their tune when it comes to open source I, software. And uh, I I can only say that, especially since I now work for one of the biggest open source yeah. companies on the freaking planet, <laughs> that um, that model, I mean, it just works. I think it works yeah. well. I think it's a good model. I've always thought it's a good model. Yeah, um, it's a even great model. I worked here. <laughs> I I just think that, uh, I, and I think I said it to somebody um, a few months ago, is that I think if my, like my if yeah, Microsoft open sourcing PowerShell, if like they're uh, if they were still in the mindset of uh, you know like the Stiff Balmer days, is probably the worst thing they could have done. Oh right, because because it allows you like for example, I can um, in my Linux box, I can uh, I, I I can connect from my Linux box, I can create uh, connect to like an Active Directory server import the Active Directory modules into my PowerShell uh, session in my Linux box and create users in Active Directory. That's like, it's insane. I, I don't have to use Windows and I can create users in Active Directory right. remotely. Yeah. That's like, that, that, that's exact. And, and I mean, because it's open source, it's never, they, they never can close the source. It's, it, oh, they, yeah, they it's never can now. take it back. Like if, if they try to take it back, people would just fork it because it's that good. I mean, Microsoft <laughs> used to be one of those companies that had the draw you in sort of model that yeah. once you were on <clears throat> Windows, it was, it was just, just a little more work to run your exchange server and just a little more work to run your Active Directory server and just a little more work to run your you know, Microsoft SQL Server. And then before you know it, your entire shop is Microsoft mm -hmm. because they had a solution for all of the major mm -hmm. needs that, a, that a, a business had. And that's changed a lot. I mean, um, they, they, don't, they don't have the lock-in men mentality anymore. And I'm happy about that. I just wonder how long it'll be before they uh, open source Windows. Uh, I, I personally <laughs> think it's, uh, it's, it's, we're not... I don't think we're long for the day because, like, it's. I feel like a lot of times the OS these days, especially the OS, is like an implementation detail. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. you can't you care about you know you don't care about Android and iOS as much because they kind of blend into each other and they're kind of the same. And as long as you got the apps that you use, <laughs> Jason you, disagrees. You're good, you're, <laughs> <laughs> you're good to go, or you know, like the. Uh, I prefer the open source module, you, you know, like I, I, I prefer to use an, an operating system that that's open and I can tweak it and I can change it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and, and that gives me like, I get to enjoy with, with, with this, with them open sourcing PowerShell, I get to enjoy both worlds. I, mean, I get you... to enjoy my Linux box and still manage my windows stuff and my Linux stuff. And like, I wasn't a developer and I can build like programs and websites and like sometimes now if I need a tool, like for example, uh, one of my friends the other day, he, he has like a big uh, photo library that he wants to update to upload to like Google uh, photos. Don't ask me why I am, I, I'm kind of against that, but whatever. <laughs> and then, uh, 
like there's no tool for Linux to do it. So I so I kind of threw like a PowerShell script together that connects you to your uh, that connects him to his account and start uploading files there. Like <clears throat> I should probably at some point clean up the co- because it's very like thrown together, but I should probably clean I mean, up the code and like publish it. Yeah, that is that is a thing other people might be interested in. Yeah. I, I could easily imagine that as a thing that other people would want to do, especially if you're all into the Google into Google ecosystem. The ecosystem, yeah. yeah. Um, so I have like some stuff I, I open sourced on my GitHub and I'm trying to like it it's really funny because I I think until like um a year ago, I always felt like an open source consumer. Like I I would like tweak stuff a little bit here and there, but not in like a meaningful mm-hmm. way. And now I feel like I really pushing code and like, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting into, uh, open sourcing stuff, creating my own projects just because I learned how to use this one thing. Uh, that is cool. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's yeah. actually really interesting that <laughs> a Microsoft product has gotten you into the open source community. More, like yeah. It's, 10, it's, uh, 10, 15 years ago, it would have been like, of. like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And uh, there are the the main reason that I opened the, the PowerShell Linux Telegram group is because I got some... Uh, it's really hard because a lot of people still have the old mindset. And it's uh, sometimes it's like it's difficult. And if you want to talk just about Linux and PowerShell, sometimes people... Uh, you know, take it the wrong way, and they they think like oh, they still think of back to like you said the Balmer days of you know, uh, and it's, well, I mean, it was <laughs> it was very akin to war at the time b- yeah. between and and, and and it wasn't that long ago. No, so. right? No, so it be- wasn't between it free wasn't. software advocates and <laughs> companies like Microsoft and Apple. It was, I mean, it really felt like we were being attacked. So it, mm-hmm. that's that's the thing that's not easy to shed, um, and you know even I I I still have a I don't want to call it a hatred anymore, but a dislike for Windows. But even right now at this moment, I recently bought a new laptop. Of course, it came with Windows 10. I haven't mm-hmm. gotten my my Fedora install quite right just yet on it, and I'm right now doing this podcast on a Windows machine, which is mm-hmm. something I don't think I've done for the entire uh, life of this podcast. I've always done it on Linux. Yeah. Um, so, but so you know, you're using a Windows machine. I'm gonna have to tender my resignation. <laughs> I think I think that maybe that's why we had the issues before. It actually wasn't your mic. It was that my Windows machine knew I, of I your hatred better. and it yep. looped yeah, it back around now. on you. Yeah. So, it, well, it, and I definitely like as an operating system. Like I've been, uh, I I've been running Linux on my box on you know my home computer for a very long time, but I. I still have Windows in like VMs and in like yeah. my home lab to play I mean, around, I, see what's there. To I do, um, I do. I mean, obviously, I, I edit stuff like this podcast on mm-hmm. on my machine, and I do some video editing, and I use Adobe's uh, software for that. Yeah, and for that, you're not running, run, you're not running on Linux. It's either yeah. a MacBook or it's Windows. And part of why I bought this new machine was because I wanted a machine I could edit 4K video on. So I'm going to be spending some time in Windows, which is why I didn't eradicate it when I first got it. <laughs> um, but there's also gaming, and there's other things that. Yeah, um, it's it's getting it's just better. Easier it's definitely getting better. Yeah. It is, and it's um, it's those things are all getting better on Linux as well, yeah, especially with the advent uh, of Steam for Linux and whatnot. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of, uh, it, I mean, corporate corporations are there to make money, and it, it's actually nice now that uh, I, I definitely don't think that Microsoft is not like open sourcing stuff to not make money. Right. Obviously, they have some. They, they're doing this because it gets them something. But it doesn't yeah. necessarily has to be a bad thing that like it also gets us the community something, and uh, the same thing with the, it's really nice to see you know open source software like Blender for three D editing being invested by like big uh, uh, Hollywood uh, studios that mm-hmm. are also there to make money, yep, or video game companies or stuff like that. Like it it doesn't have just because a company wants to make money. It doesn't necessarily mean that like you can't benefit from their open source. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like work. I yeah. mean, I like money. I think most people like money, <laughs> I right? Mean, yeah, so I, yeah. I I can't blame them for wanting to make money, right? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and I mean, and, and, and sometimes like a, a lot of times like open source and like people expect open source to be free, which I think it's like the worst. Unfortunately, it's like the worst thing for open source. It's the same thing with like podcasts. Like I think every podcast that I listen to, like I, I throw like a few dollars to them because I enjoy their contact, their content. I, mm-hmm. like, I want to give back. Uh, same thing with like open source projects. There's like a bunch of open source projects that I support. Like because just because it's it's three people spend like people spend time on it. Like they it's you know their passion and and because if they make money, their software is better, so I can enjoy it for free. Yeah. So and, like I try to. And we we do appreciate <laughs> that you yeah. are you are one of the Iron Sysman <laughs> podcasts patrons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, proud to be now, like now. Uh, if we could only get comments, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'll take money over comments. Reviews, <laughs> yeah. Reviews. Well, I don't know. More the more reviews, the more people, the more people, the more. Yeah, no, people. I get that. Yeah. I get that. The more money, the better we can make things. You know. Yeah, you can so always pay like. Uh, people. Yeah, you can always pay like there's there's people in you know all kinds of places to like fake reviews. Yeah, that's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. <laughs> yeah, no, that's my, what I heard is like people that pay like uh, and it's like really cheap to, to to get their like podcast to the top of the list on uh, you know yeah I do is all kinds of stuff. yeah my uh, <clears throat> my my video endeavor is is I've talked about it once or twice on the show before. I do a YouTube channel where I have like Jeep videos. I modify mm-hmm. Jeeps and whatever. Um, oh, nice! And uh, the channel finally, after like two years of work, finally hit a thousand subscribers, which means like it actually gets noticed by people. Yeah. So I keep getting emails from like Amazon stores and whatnot. They're like, can you go buy one of our products? Give us a review and then we'll pay you back for the product. <laughs> you get to keep the thing. I'm like, no, this sounds shady as hell. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> what happened if I give you like a one star review because your product yeah. is. I'm like, why don't you send me the product? No, no, you have to buy it. They're like, yeah, I have to buy it because then it registers on Amazon as someone who actually bought the product bought that's going to review it. That's why you're yeah. doing it that way. <laughs> it's like scammy, yeah. Yeah. Like this is this is a scam because, of course, you're going to give it a decent review because they're paying you back for it, right? You're going to yeah, feel exactly. obligated. <sighs> People. Yeah. Oh, is that how that's supposed to work? <laughs> oh, yeah, we've right, been doing right, it wrong the oops. whole time. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gone on about this for almost an hour at this point. So I think we may as well tie up the uh, the the topic. You have any mm-hmm. uh, any final thoughts on uh, PowerShell on Linux before we move on? Yeah, uh, this is the part where he denounces PowerShell and goes back to Bash. Uh, yep. <laughs> make that I make them both work. Uh, I think I have a post on Twitter that says like PowerShell plus Bash plus something else plus Python. Uh, equals like happiness or something like that yeah because there's like you could use bash from within powershell somebody created like a module that you can use python within powershell and get like objects in powershell i mean why not hey it's like it's all (laughs) big kumbaya here in linux land and and, yeah i mean the (laughs) the the one of the founding concepts of of linux is that there's a tool for lots of there's different there's lots of ways to do uh, different yeah. things like lots exactly. of ways to do the same thing is the thing I'm trying to say yeah. mm-hmm. and uh, whatever works for you is what works right exactly. so if, if I like bash and you like PowerShell and we're both doing our thing and we're both doing it well it doesn't matter yeah. <laughs> and maybe I like I can ta- it, and maybe it, I could take your bash and use it in my PowerShell there you and go then we can make like a, a website out of it and a power make a lot of money yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. I, I, I completely agree you can be wrong I can be right and we can both be happy there you go yeah. There you go. It's, it's not going to hurt you for me to be wrong, right? <laughs> All right. So I think we're going to play that transition music and move along into the part where we just ramble aimlessly about things. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm glad to see you appreciate our music. I love your music. <laughs> it's like one of the things that drew me to your podcast. I spent, I'm a big metalhead. I spent quite a bit of time trying to find music that really <laughs> sounded the way I wanted it to. It's good. Don't change it. I'm glad <laughs> to hear it. In fact, I don't know if, if Jason, if you remember this, like this is one of the things that I had to have right before we started the podcast. I'm like sending him sound <laughs> clips. I'm like, how does this one sound? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I think I, I think I actually have all of those sound clips. 
Yeah, well, um, I mean, I shared them to you through my old Nextcloud that's not running anymore. So maybe you don't, uh, unless you download no, them. No, 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 I, I, da- I had to download them to listen to them. So. Good point. Mm-hmm. Good point. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, as far as I know, this this came from uh, the Defensive Security Podcast, where they had the uh, crazy yeah. music at the beginning. Right, and, and right. We were like, so well, we have to match that. There were the... Uh, the 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 two shows that influenced Iron Sysadmin was Paul Security Weekly, and that that's mm-hmm. where I got kind of our format from, like the very laid back format that we try mm-hmm. to follow, and uh, the Defensive Security Podcast because that's just a fun show and and yeah the, actually, the intro music catches me. <laughs> I I never heard of either one of them. I'll go check them really? out. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Paul's uh, Paul Security Weekly is actually a network of podcasts. He has, I don't know how many shows at this point. They've got, you know, uh, Paul Security Weekly is the show that started it all. And that's like a two, three hour ramble fest between him <laughs> and a bunch of, a bunch of experts. Uh, they usually have right. interviews and news and whatever. Um, it's, uh, it's, so he's got Paul Security Weekly, Business Security Weekly, um, Enterprise Security Weekly, Application Security Weekly, and now there's a Compliance Security Weekly. There, there's so many of them, I'm actually having trouble keeping up at this point. Yeah, I, I actually don't listen to it nearly as often as I used to. I used to listen to every show right after it came out, and especially now that I don't have a commute. I don't have time. I'm so behind on every podcast I listen to. It's terrible, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you need to like pretend to get stuck in traffic. Just yeah, right. I just need to go, go for a drive to listen to podcasts. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've started listening to them while I sit here at my desk now. So that's I'll, I'll catch up eventually. But now I've got like a year <laughs> of podcasts to catch up on. <laughs> yeah. I listen to like all the podcasts at I think 1.4, 1.5 speed. Yeah. And I use like uh one of the apps to cut like the white no the the, the, the <laughs> segments be and I think like I'm I'm up to like 66 days of just like straight listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so if, if you I, add in Paul Security Weekly, then you're going to have another three hour show every week <laughs> to, to try to fit in there. I <laughs> haven't tried video at one and a half speed yet, but I started playing with one and a half speed on the audio podcasts. Mm-hmm. And um, man, they, it, 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 it's entertaining. It's, <laughs> they, it's really definitely entertaining. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult, like especially the ones that you've been listening to a long time. And then you're like, you talk to the people using voice like this, for example, and it takes like it takes you a little bit to like, oh, they sound slower. Yeah, I'd imagine that your <laughs> your brain would would compensate for it, and then when you go back to listen yeah. to doing it normally, you're like, what? One of the <laughs> one of the other podcasts I listened to, um, one of their callers or somebody wrote in or something, and they mm-hmm. said that uh, if you want to laugh, listen to the show at half speed instead of one and a half. Yeah, because everybody sounds like drunk. Because it's like... all slow. Well, the, the one <laughs> host on the show has a really deep voice and he's really laid back and he already talks like it sounds <laughs> like he's had a drink. When you play him at half speed, he sounds flat out drunk. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> I love it. I wish I had the time to do, to, yeah, to do right. this, but it's like it takes too much time. All right. So anyway, um, let's see. We have any announcements? Um, I, I didn't bother to gather all the Patreon info. If you go back to our last show, it's the same patrons. <laughs> 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 and uh, we still appreciate them all just as much. Um, although uh, one patron did lower their uh, their patronage, but he's been with us since the beginning. So I'm, I'm still very grateful that he didn't uh, close it off completely. So that's cool. Um Jason, you got some stuff in here about Whopper Summit? Yeah, so Whopper Summit is uh, March 27th to the 29th. It is happening at the Holiday Inn Express at in Fort Washington, PA. Um, so it is a, uh, unlike most of the conferences that I see around, which are either, you know, focused on software or security or, you know, like some some cloud service uh whopper summit is more aimed on to the hardware aspect of things um Mm -hmm. it's almost it's not quite a maker fair um but it's it's aimed towards teaching you hardware and Mm. uh uh they've got a a bunch of really good speakers this year um uh that haven't been announced yet um i may have the inside (laughs) track don't Uh, tell anybody this Look, it's going to be really awesome. There's some really cool people coming. And uh, uh, the badge design this year is is absolutely amazing. Uh, the guys are doing a, a, 
uh, just knocking it out of the park. And uh, uh, so that's coming up soon. And uh, tickets are available, so go get yours. Is uh, is Whopper a little more adults only, or is it uh, family friendly? Oh hell no, no. Um, our our, our favorite. Uh, I don't know if she's eleven or twelve now, but um, yeah, our, our but favorite she, little. Uh, she goes to DefCon. She doesn't count. I, it's, <laughs> but it, it's, I mean, it's an average family. <laughs> it's definitely kid friendly. Okay. Um, she is. We there were a lot of kids there last year, and that was okay. at, at, that was in Atlantic City. So yes, wow. Kid friendly. So, um, so by by hardware, you mean like the uh, and not like Maker Fair. It's more like less three D printing, more you know circuit boards and prototyping and stuff like um, that. Um. So I don't. I but, but by not Maker Fair, I don't mean you're going to walk in and there's going to be a hundred different vendors hawking their mm-hmm. their different three D making tools. Um. What I mean is, it's the the people that are there aren't there to sell you something they're there to mm. teach you something oh that's cool. and you'll learn uh about electronics you'll learn i mean there's definitely aspects of programming um they do they, they do talks uh there's 3d printing um you know so it's 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 more on the hardware side of things than the software side of things nice. someone someone needs to get integral down there with his uh with his derby from DerbyCon last year <laughs> I th- would love to get integral down there. Um, I'll have to reach out to him, but I, I'm, you know, it's, it's a smaller con and it's not yeah. security focused. So yep. I don't know how hard it is for him to get to those. Yeah. Right. He's not local to anywhere near us. <laughs> I'm just trying to see how far away this is. Oh, it's like an hour away. I'm going to totally have to try to get there. This oh, year. from us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's like an hour. I didn't get to I'm... go last year. I'm going to have to try to make it this year. Yeah, definitely make it out. Um, you know, like I said, they're they're knocking it out of the park. They've been working on us literally since last year. Are we gonna have a DEFCON six one oh tour bus again like we did last year? <laughs> <laughs> For Whopper? Was uh, it, I don't wasn't there like a whole contingent of uh, of DEFCON six one oh that went down there? No, that the was Whopper? actually um no, that was B sides Long Island. Oh, I'm thinking of the wrong conference. I thought they yes, went to Whopper. Yes, you are. Or is it just that there's no. a lot of people involved in Whopper from DEFCON? They're, well, they're, um, there's, there's only one regular member of 610 that's in Whopper. Okay. Um, but most of Whopper, most? No, at least half of Whopper has been to 610. So, um, I wouldn't cool. say they're, they're 610 members, but yeah, they're, yeah. they're definitely family. So speaking of, uh, we had a DEF CON 610 meetup last night, and we had like the highest attendance ever. It was awesome. We had like 35 people packed in Two Rivers Brewing. It's pretty cool. I got It's say. a little crowded, but it, uh, it was it fun. It was a little crowded. Unfortunately, the, uh, the AWS meetup down the hall had only a few. I don't know if that was our fault or not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it wasn't. <laughs> All right, so it, this it, it is... takes time to build that. It ta- it takes time to build the, yeah. the group. I mean, yeah, look that's how what long it is. we've look, look how long it took DC six ten to get was, above like five people. I was thinking about this just earlier. We've been around for like three years, DefCon six one zero, and um, the early meetups. There might have been ten people that came regularly, and that's just, yeah, that's but, just but built over it time. Was, it, it was. It was before that too. I mean, it was before even Danny got involved. Um, uh, Rando, I mean, we we had tried to to set something up and sort of get something regular, and it was on and off. And, oh, you mean you? And, yeah, you mean the like Keith's attempt at uh, yeah at yep. NEPA Infosec. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that didn't go over well, but that also wasn't regular enough. I I think the key is that DefCon Six One Zero has been reliably every month for three years. We've had a meetup, right? And that's that's what did it. Yeah, that's probably the only reliable part. And we're awesome, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the part of the show where we would talk about reviews, but once again, we don't have any new ones to talk about. Except, uh, well, I had some conversation in Slack after our last show. You may remember on our last show, I I brought up how we we might not uh, record the week of Christmas, which we didn't. Um, and that's partially because this guy spoke up in Slack and said, like, don't worry about it. <laughs> you guys have families. <laughs> Enjoy your family. Yeah, yeah. it's important. Yeah. Um, 
He said, and I'm paraphrasing here because I didn't want to copy everything out of Slack, uh, but he basically said it's a great show. And uh, we also talked about whether we should go back to streaming live or not, which I think we're going to. Uh, but he said, don't worry about it too much. Um, he did say that he likes to stream, but he gets it right. that It's it's difficult. Um, as demonstrated tonight for the, <laughs> the hour that we spent trying to get that stupid stream thing working. Uh, anyway, um, he also said that he can't leave comments on Spotify, which I guess could explain why. I mean, I don't check Spotify for reviews anyway. Come on, Spotify, so. <laughs> get with it. Add a comment section already. <laughs> but we're on Spotify and Stitcher. I don't know if either of those let you leave reviews. So that could be part of why people aren't say, aren't leaving reviews, because they can't I mean, I, on the platforms they're using. I doubt Spotify does, and I doubt they ever will. I mean, they're, they're a music streaming company. Yeah, they sort the of tacked on podcasts. Is, yeah. If um, only there I was some sort don't of know technology. Anything about <laughs> if only we had some form of technology that like gets all the reviews from all the platforms and yeah, puts it in one right. place. So um <laughs> I'll say this. If you're on a platform that doesn't let you leave reviews and you're just dying to leave a review, there's two things you can do. One, you can go to iTunes and leave a review, which maybe some people have ideological problems with Apple. I don't know. If that's the case, go to ironsysadmin.com and write a comment on uh, whatever episode you know, you're listening to that you want to leave a review on. Uh, I may not get it instantaneously, but I do have to go review all the comments on that page uh, frequently because I get a lot of spam there. Um, so as long as I don't accidentally delete your comment as spam, <laughs> I'll see <laughs> your review there. <laughs> And 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 we have DM here. He can he can go and write a bunch of PowerShell. There you go. And he can add a comment section to both Spotify and Stitcher and link together the other comment sections from all the other places. Perfect. And we could just have a universal comment system. Perfect. That's actually a good idea. I'll think about just it. Just aggregate all the. Or comments. maybe we just need to sprinkle some uh, blockchain on that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> there has to be some blockchain. No, only if there's machine learning and artificial intelligence. Machine learning Otherwise, and it doesn't work. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. So that's it for reviews. Um, but really, folks, we, as we say every time, we we'd love to hear from folks whether we're doing good or bad, so we know what you guys like. So. Let us know. Oh, and of course, you can always do what Mark did and go join our Slack channel and uh, chat with us directly that way, which is cool. So, um, anybody have anything cool going on that we want to chat about before we get into news? Uh, How much time you have? Yeah, right. There's all <laughs> kinds of stuff, right? I'm I'm building a bunch of Windows machines. That's not really cool, though. It doesn't sound like something you you really enjoy that much. I'm I'm actually remember no. that. Remember that rack that you and your dad gave me? Yeah. I finally have it cut down to a half rack, and I'm finally, like, recabling it and rebuilding it, and I'm going to actually move any machines that I'm still running into that rack. Didn't you start that, like, many, many months ago? The, the cutting it down, yes. But then, oh, I, okay. but then I, like, got a new job, and... <laughs> Speaking of many, many, many months... Yeah, the, right. The book, Those the shelves, shelves of yours, they, they went up in, like, a day, too, didn't they? Uh, yes. Yes. As far as you're concerned, it was a day. Yeah, so, I mean, I got the thing cut down, but then there was all the interior, the interior rails that you actually mount all the servers to. I had to cut them down, which I didn't I did do right away. I got that done, and I got them mounted in there. I, I now have a single switch mounted in, in the rack. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> so it started. I have it <laughs> to the I, point where I can I, start doing stuff. I actually have a pretty cool project to share with you guys. Um, it's called Hass.io. Have you heard of it? I don't think so. Um, there's an open source project called uh, Home Assistant. Okay. It's kind of like, uh, 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 like it's an uh, open source uh, implementation of kind of like all these uh, smart homes, smart hubs. Oh, that's cool. Like Sync thing and stuff like that. So they have um, something called uh, Hess.io. It's it's kind of like an, an appliance version that has, it's like uh, you could run it on a Raspberry Pi or in a virtual machine or install it like on an Intel NUC. And uh, I've been playing, I've, I've been playing with it. I'm running it in a virtual machine. And it's, it's pretty sweet. Like you, uh, it, it's kind of like you, it allows you to disconnect from all these cloud services that suck your information. Like uh, I connected it to, uh, my smart light using you know the the regular LAN, um, 
all kinds of like media services. I have it controlling my LG TV and stuff like that. It's uh, That's it's cool. really neat and it's all open source. That's pretty cool. Um, Wonder it sounds like something that Ed Scotus would be using in his office. <laughs> so wait, it's it's all open source. Does that mean Richard Stallman gets all of your data? Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. Now he's been kicked off, so maybe he's like. Maybe he doesn't get all my data anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I figured he was using it to teach his parrot how to talk. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, projects, projects, projects. Uh, nothing exciting. Nothing I can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, and another thing I'm doing is uh, I found out there's like this micro uh, controller and this open source software called WLED. Uh, okay. That allows you to create like um, a Wi-Fi control uh, LED strips for like almost no money, and there's like a bunch of posts on the internet how oh, to do cool. it. That's um, cool. Ah, things my kids don't need to know about. Yeah, right. Your house will be filled with LED strips that are wirelessly controlled, flashing at just, all hours of the day. Just connect it to like the door and 3D print something that says like on air, and then when you start yes. like recording, there like you go. on I need air. One of those. I need one of those because my kids <laughs> like frequently walk in on the show. <laughs> yeah. And you can, uh, I think the microcontroller, like you can buy four of them for like five bucks, six bucks on Amazon and like the LED cool. strips and another, like, I think you could buy like a hundred LED strips uh, for, I think like 20 bucks or something. You could like, I've seen people do like some really amazing things. That's cool. <clears throat> well, I guess we can move on into the news. We have some fun ones mm -hmm. for tonight. <laughs> Here we go. So what I what I really need before we do the news is to pour my next beer. So give me just a moment. <laughs> well, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that live on 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 the on the chat here, you, you're gonna have to explain what kind of beer you're drinking, exactly, well, exactly. why you've chosen it. This oh, one's, it's Blue Moon. Never yeah, this, mind. This one's nothing special. It just it was left over it's, from Christmas. Uh, <laughs> leftover beer? That yeah. doesn't sound right. Well, well, it's I, Blue uh, Moon. That would always be left over. No, my my brother-in-law <laughs> likes likes Blue Moon, and it's it's not terrible. It's not bad beer. It's not like mm -hmm. it's Bud Light or something. Um, oh yeah, it's it's. That and like Sam Adams and Yingling, they're they're like the bottom of the the scale for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the news. <laughs> the first article I had to include this because it is both scandalous and cool all at the same time. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Agreed. So um I'm sure you've heard of this trend. Um Young women with with pretty bodies get on the internet and they decide that they're going to show said bodies to make money. Um, this is probably what helped build the internet, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, this is where the internet. <laughs> well, was I mean, this, this this predates the internet by a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, a uh, Instagram model, um, another uh, interesting trend from recent years, uh, named Kaylin Ward. And I guess she uses her full name. I mean, I guess if you're going to show off your uh, naughty bits on the internet, you can tie it to your full name without being worried about privacy. Um, she. Uh, so you also may have heard that there are uh, some pretty terrible wildfires in uh, in Australia at the moment. I don't know how that's going because, to be honest, U.S. news isn't really covering it, which is kind of terrible if you think about it. Uh, someone showed a graphic of Australia superimposed over the United States to in order to show us the scope of these wildfires. And most of the United States would be on fire right now if they were experiencing wow. the same wildfires, which is pretty damn terrible. <laughs> now, I don't know, like, landmass-wise, how big Australia is compared to the continental U.S., um, if they're really that similar or if they blew it up to really make it dramatic, but... Uh, Anyway, it is what it is. Wildfires are bad. Um, naked women make a lot of money. This woman decided to put the two together, and it, I think, I really think it was on a whim. Uh, so she went to Twitter, and she posted a, a uh, very, very slightly censored naked picture of herself. 
Uh, and she said, she listed a whole bunch of charities that are giving to uh, the Australian wildfire relief funds, uh, you know, that benefit firefighters and whatnot. And she said, hey, uh, anyone who donates to any of these charities and sends me proof that they've done so, I'll send you a naked picture. The woman, at the point that this article is written, has raised $700,000. And is uh, an expert at identifying people that are trying to pull one over on her and has posted said uh, proof on the internet as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, people, yeah, so, so uh, there were a couple posts where people had posted, um, they tried to send her faked receipts yeah. from various different places. Because they and, just want to see her naked. Yeah. Yes, I mean, come on, donate could, $10 and get a naked picture. She, yeah, exa that was exactly <laughs> like, what come she on. <laughs> she, she basically said, you took the time to fake this instead of sending 10 bucks to help somebody. You're right. an asshole. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> indeed. The only the only surprising thing, I mean, I guess the whole thing is surprising, but like the part that surprises me is that they deleted her account for this. Yeah, on Instagram. In, well, it's Instagram against did. it's against the Instagram terms of services. You, you can't actually show nudity on Instagram, which is the thing. Twitter well, on but, the but, other but, hand. Did, but did she show <laughs> nudity on Instagram? No, no I'm not so, sure that she did. No, 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 no. So mm. what happened is she was on she was doing this on Twitter and on Instagram, and from what I understand. She also posted on Instagram basically the same message. If you donate and send me proof, right. I will send you right. nudes. Right. And that that it's stupid, but that arguably breaks the rules because you, of you Instagram. Cross post or something? No, it's not, not the cross post. post because, it's the promise of no, nudes. It's, exactly, mm, because it's I it's see. a it's a transaction. Like now, a there are a whole lot of these Instagram models who will be like, if you give me money on Patreon, that's where all my naked pictures are. So you got to wonder how they stay on the platform because uh, they're very they open about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's I think it's it's a direct transaction versus. For, well, I don't know. It's, it's a good yeah, question. Like, like the yeah. interesting thing here is that the, she based on this, she, she actually never got any money like they went and gave it to like yeah. a third party. Yeah, she didn't get paid for this. Yeah. So she I, has... you know what it is? It's it's Mark Zuckerberg is afraid of boobs. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Well, listen, I mean, I can't <clears throat> blame poor Mark Zuckerberg. He's been under a lot of fire lately. <laughs> yeah. He's got to be careful. Facebook is turning into like a kindergarten play school. <laughs> I don't know if, if either of you yeah. use. I know you don't, Jason. I don't know if. I'm if sorry. Do, I don't know what you're talking about. My Facebook account has been people, disabled forever. People's oh. posts on Facebook are getting uh, reported and, and, uh, uh, banned and whatnot for the stupidest reasons because Facebook is so on the defensive right now over all kinds of stuff. So, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's right what they did. I mean, this, yes, she arguably broke their terms of service by promising nakedness for money, um, but it's not her money. She's giving it to charity. Like, uh, I don't know. It's such a gray area. But I, I guess rules know. are rules, right? I think more power to her. I mean, if uh, I'm sure a lot of houses were burned, if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you like put it on the size of the U.S. is like a lot of people that are in need. Uh, if yeah, you do something about it. I think uh, more power to her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's cool. Um, I don't know how I'd feel about my own kids, you know, doing this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but uh, some woman I don't know. I mean, I think it's 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 kind of cool. She's renamed herself to the naked ph philanthropist, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're already doing it, go market it even further. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. She also I it's not in this article, I don't think. But I went and found her on Twitter because I wanted to see what kind of fallout she was getting for this. Mm -hmm. I also linked the original tweet, by the way, in the show notes. But, yeah, I see it, yeah. But um, she actually said that her family has disowned her over this, and her boyfriend wow. has left her. <laughs> because she raised $700,000 for Australia by maybe showing off maybe his nakedness. Was, maybe was he's pissed boyfriend's... because like, he didn't get the money. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't know why her boyfriend would leave her over this. Maybe he's that jealous. I don't know. But was, he, was he confused prior? Because if I understand correctly... She was a nude model before. Yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of what I thought. Maybe so, maybe he's upset because maybe, she didn't catch maybe in on he it. Maybe he just maybe he wasn't aware. 
She maybe, was keeping it a secret. Maybe he wasn't aware, and now he's aware because it's all over the news. I mean, that's the same deal for her family, right? Like, why would they disown her now? <laughs> Is it because she's famous uh, for it? She's famous for being naked on the internet instead of just uh, being like, I, I don't like even hidden ask those and questions. naked on the internet. <laughs> families, <laughs> families are weird. It's, yeah, maybe, maybe people didn't know before it blew up, and now like right, they know about right. it. Right, but know. like her boyfriend, how would her boyfriend not know? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I guess he's just blind. He was really naive. Anyway, yeah. moving on. So yeah, moving on. Uh, the next one is um, Google. Is oh, it's. Uh, Probably should have mentioned where that last article was from. The Guardian. <laughs> the Guardian <laughs> is, is linked in the show notes. Uh, the next one is from VoiceBot. That, what is this? I don't even know where I found this article. VoiceBot.ai. 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 Yeah. Where, it's where I go to get all of my news. Uh, okay. So <laughs> anyway. Oh, it looks like it'll read it to you. Maybe that's why they call it that. There's a listen button. Uh. Anyway, uh, the article is uh, Google Assistant blocks... How do you pronounce this? Xiaomi? Xiaomi. 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 Xiaomi? <laughs> Whatever. I guess it depends thing. on the side of the world. It starts with an X, <laughs> and I don't know if it's silent or not. <laughs> uh, blocks the cameras after the Nest uh, after Nest Hub begins showing random people's homes. So I, this is obviously a software bug. I don't think it was ever intentional. But apparently, and um, I've included, I think, two articles that cover this. Uh, these cameras were showing other people's homes to people when they were asking for their, uh, you know, for asking their smart assistants to show them whatever was supposed to be on their camera. Which is pretty, uh, pretty crazy stuff. Um, I don't know. Is that like an off by one? Did you get your neighbor's house instead of yours? I don't know. No, they. I think uh, when when I was reading about it, uh, they said that it was like some for some like it was pulling some form of like cash. Oh, okay. That only like some people saw, and the, the the quality wasn't the best, but it's still pretty disturbing. Yeah, it is. I mean, <clears throat> I don't uh, know. The one article had a had an example I, picture in it. It's not the one I'm looking at. Though. I feel like I feel like Xiaomi is not. Um, this isn't the first time there have been issues like this with stuff that they've created. So, I, I suspect this is. I mean, like most most like a lot of IoT stuff, it is basically the cheapest possible device you can get yeah well in both the software and the hardware so you you you're you're not going to get any security this has been this has been the problem since like <clears throat> the dawn of time there's a cool product that does a really cool thing whatever that is and it's expensive because it was expensive to put all the work in to make it do the cool stuff Right. And it's and it's made by a reputable vendor and it's it's awesome and everybody wants to buy it, but nobody wants to spend the money on it. So you have other manufacturers who make it the same same in very heavy quotes <laughs> product for much, much cheaper. And that same product is not nearly as well engineered and not nearly as well uh, put together and not nearly as well operated. And that's probably what happened here. I don't know what a camera from these people costs. Um, but I can say, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm stereotyping, but from the name, <laughs> it sounds like it's an off brand. <laughs> they're, they're, actually, they're actually really big in, uh, in, in this side of the world and, okay. uh, and, uh, like Europe, uh, that, um, but, uh, the, I think the problem is not just Xiaomi. I think the problem is like with everything IOT and the scale, uh, I mean, software, uh, it's always going to have, I think, well, I don't know if always, but software have bugs. Oh and, yeah. And the, pro and the problem when always you always is a good word to use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, so, so software have bugs. The problem with this kind of stuff and this kind of scale is that these bugs are kind of catastrophic. Like they, Oh yeah. If somebody can see, if you put this camera in your house, somebody can see into your house. Like, uh, and the, the thing is, is people <clears throat> don't want, uh, the complexity of managing their own devices. Mm hmm. Uh, so they let other com the, these companies manage their own devices, and uh, there's, uh, bugs like that can 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 be bad. Yeah, well, I mean, this stuff used to be <laughs> the sort of thing that only the technologically elite would set up because nobody wanted to deal with the complexity. And now, slowly but surely, those things are becoming more commoditized. So, mm -hmm. well, but you know. but it's it's just a doorbell, and it's just a, just, a security yeah. camera, and it's you know. Yeah. Just a, a internet connected toaster. Like what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. the, the, the average person doesn't understand that even your internet connected toaster that has no ability to listen or see anything in your house can still act as a pivot point to get into everything else. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Or the uh, some and or the the same the same thing that happened with Ring uh, a few days a few weeks ago, where people don't secure their account with good passwords because you know it's just an interconnected thing, and all of a sudden your doorbell screaming, "There's fire in the house! Everybody should get out!" Like right. Uh, because it's 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 too easy I, to set up, and uh, and people yeah. don't think about the repercussions of, yep. of what these things. I, I do. want I my doorbell to scream. That would be cool. <laughs> 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 give me your give me the password to your ring doorbell. I yeah, we'll make it scream, scream for you. <laughs> Send me a ring doorbell, and I'll give you the yeah, password. Okay, okay. <laughs> F funny enough, like they were. Uh, I remember reading an article where they were. They were some some police department in some parts of the state were giving yep. the, the doorbells almost free. We talked about this. Oh no! Have, yeah. yeah. So so Ring actually has agreements with a lot of different police departments where they sell the Ring doorbells at a loss to the police yeah. department, so yep. that the police will then give them to local people and have them install them. Yeah, and they, yeah, they, and they build on them. <laughs> they build it as as like a neighborhood watch thing, so that the police yeah. can see what's going on in the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean they're not spying and, like on them in right. their homes, and, but they're spying what's outside of their house, right? No, so yeah. and, and like, look, I mean, arguably I, public already anyway, right? Right. I'm like, I'm. It it sounds like a great thing, like you know, like oh, uh, uh, this would help a neighborhood watch. Yeah, that's great. My problem is with that is that I don't trust you. I don't care if you're a cop. I don't trust you to do the right thing. And and the fact that you're right. able to get video of of whatever without having any context necessarily yeah. means yeah. that you're you you know you're going to go after the worst that you know you can get. Like, oh, I, I busted this guy for stealing something, but it's my neighbor picking up my packages because I asked him to. Right. My my biggest fear with these things is that all this information is is stored somewhere. And mm -hmm. what scares me is not the algorithms of today. What scares me is the algorithm of 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Right. Like the, you, you know, like what you can do now with, a, with, a, with AI and a pixelated picture. And can you imagine what can be done with like a video and an algorithm and the compute power of, you know, 20 years from now and the information they can find on you? What? Why do you think we're capturing the video from this this, exactly. this little talk right now? Uh, <laughs> I can't wait. I mean, as soon as we're done here, I'm setting up the deep fake. Oh, no. <laughs> Just wait until the video comes out of you denouncing PowerShell, PowerShell for the evil that it is <laughs> and going yeah. back to, to bash. F fake, uh, yeah, like the, the what is it? The, uh, what are they called? The fake... Uh, D deep fakes yeah the deep, deep fakes. fakes yeah deep yeah. fakes yeah yeah all right so moving along uh this one's from i'm, I'm like full of the no name news agencies tonight nova night.com <laughs> novi night uh i don't know anyway um i probably could have found lots of other places reporting this but apparently microsoft is ending uh windows 7 support which is kind of a sad day. Windows 7 was probably one of the best builds of windows in recent uh history windows 10 ain't so uh, bad but it's isn't it ended uh well oh, no, so it's, it's it uses next, week. next it, week it uses wording that's saying that uh <laughs> it's it's ended on january 14th as though that's already yeah, happened it's next, next but week. it's actually not so <laughs> <laughs> maybe they published too early i don't know but here it is yeah i what i what i really love is is how everybody is concerned about windows 7 end of life and, right. and nobody will even mention windows 8 yeah because yeah, Windows well, 8 was like this this release that nobody wanted but didn't have a choice. Windows yeah, I think it, uh, you know. what was the code name for Windows 8? Was it Vista? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So, so yeah, is is Windows Windows 8 is still under support then, I would assume. Yeah, it is. Yeah. The Windows yeah, 8 Windows um, 2 I believe Windows 2008 is also um, yeah, they're the same uh, code base. Yeah, two thousand. No, but no, 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 no. I think I think Windows. Yeah, so Windows two thousand and eight and two thousand eight are two also end support on January fourteenth. Oh, really? Is that? I in think two thousand and eight is. No, it's not in this article. Yeah. Um, I know that's because, funny. Uh, <laughs> I, they don't I mention may, it. I may I may know this because uh, it came up 
in conversations somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere like the place you work for that's still running in 2008? I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> such things. Yeah. Okay, then, moving on. <laughs> so if you're still running a Windows 7 box, uh, which I can't blame you for, uh, it's going to lose support on the 14th. Sorry. And if you're if you're running a Windows 2008 server box, oh, come on, upgrade already. If, if, if it's going to make you laugh, I had to install Windows 2003 uh, a few days ago in a lab to oh, simulate yeah. a big client in the U.S. that uses it. Mm. Funny enough, um, their their activation uh, their activation uh, telephone number still works. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I mean, I, I I don't I knew I knew of a a large telecom company uh, as of well, eh, it's it's <laughs> been it's been a number of years at this point, but they were still running OS two. So yeah, I mean OS two was, that was, was big in that, that space. was that was a good at least a decade after OS two was dead. Um, OS two was awesome. I miss OS two. Oh, OS two is great. Um, oh, it's in the other room. I have I still have my OS two uh, uh, my OS two warp box. I had discs. I forget if I pirated them or if <laughs> I bought them, but I had them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I swear I pointed out on the show before. I, I, it's, you did. I haven't put it on the shelf yet, but you yeah, did. I still have it. You did. So anyway, uh, moving on. We got another article. This one's from Forbes. Um, it's kind of a gaming article. Um, I don't know. Read it if you want. But basically, uh, they're positing that Microsoft and Xbox are holding the golden key to the future of gaming. Um it comes down to basically the combination of all of the technologies that Microsoft has already debuted on Xbox and mm -hmm. how Forbes seems to think that they may uh, be able to leverage all of those things uh, to make the best gaming platform ever. Um, well, uh, the key to this is that they've turned it into a service and right, not a... Right. Not, they, so it used to be that you go to the store, you buy a game. And then it became you go onto your console and you buy a game. Right. The key to this this Xbox thing is is Game Pass. Yeah. It's that so the you, they, you subscribe. They keep referring to it as the Netflix of gaming, <clears throat> which yes. is which. Yeah, and they're not wrong. Which is cool. It, it's what I was hoping Stadia would would deliver, and it didn't. Um, on on, uh -oh. on Stadia, what? Have you soured on Stadia? No, no. I I like Stadia. Uh, it's it's oh I. You do? I should say that I don't <laughs> I don't dislike it any more than I did the last time we talked about it. It's fun and it works and it's neat and it's amazing that it works at all. <laughs> which yeah. is which is what I like about it. What I don't like about it is their model for games, their model for selling games. Um so you pay a subscription fee to be Stadia Pro, right? And mm -hmm. you don't just get to play whatever games that they offer, which is kind of what I thought Stadia Pro was going to be. Instead, you get discounts on games, uh, on some games. On other games, you pay full price. Um, so, you know, you pay 60 bucks for a game <coughs> that you don't even get physical media for. And if you stop using Stadia or lose access to Stadia or Google turns off Stadia because they've never done that before... Um, oh, no. There's not a, a website dedicated for all the projects that Google killed. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so then, then you'll just sort of lose access to that game, um, which is not cool. Um, however, if yeah, it, if it no. were a subscription service where I wasn't paying for games, I was instead paying monthly, and then I chose to cancel or the service went away, that's a little more tolerable because it's a service that's gone. Just like if Netflix were to belly up and uh, I wouldn't be paying for Netflix anymore, I couldn't go watch The Lion King like I used to, or whatever it is. <laughs> or Orange is yeah, the New so, Black. So I, I've been an Xbox gamer for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I used to be a PlayStation guy and I, I loved PS2, absolutely adored my PS2. Um, and I tried very, very, very hard to get into PS3 and just, I don't know what it was. I just couldn't get, I still have my PS3. It's right over there in a bag. Yeah. It, I, I take just, it to the meetup. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get it. I don't know. Something was missing. And, and at that, that time, custom somebody framework? Had given me, yeah, no, right. <laughs> somebody had given me an Xbox 360 and there was a community like instantly it just there was this community of people to play with and, and all this stuff and it sort of continued all the way up to the current xbox 
And Game Pass was something that when it came out, I looked at it and went, eh, I don't need that. And like within two or three months, I looked at it and went, well, but wait, if I get that, and these games have been staying on Game Pass for the past couple months, and they're just adding to it, I could play all the games that I just paid, you know, $100 for, and it would have only cost me 30 bucks so far. So, right. you know, so at this point, I have Game Pass. Um, I have the, the version with uh, gold, I think, so that I have all the bells and whistles. And I only buy the games that I know or either aren't on Game Pass or I know that I want to keep for, you know, eternity. So so that's sort of the, the thing that I'm doing. And my oh, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> no, no, no. Go, go for it. I was going to say, like, my biggest fear with these, like, game streaming platforms is that especially in open source we the community revives so many games after their um studios abandoned them like <clears throat> we have uh, open ra we have uh you know open uh, morrowind we got like so many games uh, that you, you could still you know play commodore games or nes games because you have access to physical media and my fear with all these uh, cloud streaming, and every if everything goes cloud streaming, then you don't have access to the game files. And then when when a streaming company or like a gaming company doesn't want to support a game anymore, they just yank it out, and you don't have you lose like all access to that game. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so there's that. Um, but we're already seeing um, that problem with games that do have physical media. So if you if you look back to some of the old online RPGs where you, I mean, you got physical media, you purchased it at the store, you installed it, you played it, and then the company went out of business or they decided this game is old and we're not going to support it anymore and they get rid of the servers. And now you have, you know, I paid 60 bucks for this, this disc and I can't use it anymore. And then in some cases... <clears throat> The community gets and builds those servers and starts bringing that up again. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the ones that get sued and cease and desist and everything else. I mean, this is it's going to continue going around and around and around. But um, I, I don't I don't disagree. It took me a long time to get to the point where I was more comfortable with buying digital media. And to be honest, I'm lazy. And that's why I, I have a lot of digital media at this point. Um, I don't see Xbox going away anytime soon. Um, I do like playing retro games and it comes up every once in a while. So I like the backwards compatibility of these systems. Um, but yeah, at some point in the future, some of those games I'm sure are no longer going to be playable and there's no way for me to go back and, and get them and, and we'll see what happens. The, the media doesn't have to be physical. What I mean by physical uh, is like access to the game files. Yeah, as long yeah, as yeah. you have no, no. access to the game files right. and somebody like re-implement, you know, does it like a clean room re-implementation of the engine, you can keep the game alive. Like, but uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I don't think uh, the the gaming platform will go away. Like Xbox, PlayStation, all of these are great, but I just don't think I, I'm. I, I think I think that giving like the cloud if cloud gaming will be the only way to game i think it will be like a pretty sad day for the for the for you know the gaming community so to speak i yeah, think I, I, I think what we need is more companies like id software where a couple of years after the games came out they open source the engines yeah full yep. full and complete yep. because and 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 Carmack is exactly right, right? Like, so the technology that's in the engine is only good for so long. Mm -hmm. And then it, everybody has it. Their IP, honestly, for that short period was the engine, but their, 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 their core IP was the actual, in the case of like Doom and Quake, that's the WAD files. It's yeah. the, it's it's the graphics and the story that, that they built and the music right. and the sounds and everything else. A true creative the endeavor. endeavor the, the IP uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So you were saying, Nate? Um, what was I saying? I don't know. Well, oh, I was, I was I was going <laughs> to agree. I think that uh, that I don't think streaming uh, gaming services are really like I'm not excited about it. I think it's neat technology. 
I'm not excited that that's that's the direction things are going because I I, I do think that having a physical console and and whatnot <clears throat> there's a certain feel to that and the requirement for internet access that you get with a streaming service um, I don't know I've with with Stadia I've had a decent experience with it there have been some glitches right mm -hmm. so if you want to if you want a full on high definition fast paced gaming experience i don't think you're going to get that on a streaming service um the games i was playing to test it out were were tomb raider games which aren't twitch games mm -hmm. they're more like puzzle and and like jumpy games platform games yeah, um, platform which game, yeah. which aren't aren't quite as sensitive to like the twitchiness of like a first person shooter or something I don't know that there are any first-person shooters currently on Stadia. I'd be curious to see how they would play. There, I think there's uh, Destiny Two is like a first-person. Oh yeah, shooter. that does yeah. have a first-person shooter <clears throat> element to it. Yes. But uh, another thing is the is the I think so many games and and projects and things came out of 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 for example modding. Like yeah. Dota started as a as a mod to Warcraft Two. Like. Uh, um gary's mod was uh you know is a game that spun out of the source engine that the that, that bob created it's we also you know kind of i think killing the next generation of and the creativity and uh, but maybe they'll find a way to you know allow you to mod while streaming like you know yeah a, i can't a, imagine but, but how I, that I, would work yeah but it's it, <clears throat> but you're they right need modding, to give you like yeah. more access to the to their you know, streaming platform. That's the thing, the though. Like, <clears throat> gaming, I don't think game developers ever really support the modding community. Uh, probably don't, but, uh, I mean, you can play Skyrim in, like, 4K because some some guy really likes Skyrim, or girl, yeah. who really likes Skyrim, now, there's, and there's sat a... in their basement and, you know, like, made this, like, amazing uh, thing. I just think it's a, it's a, it'd be a shame uh, as a as a gamer to lose something like that. Yeah, there's there's a lot of game companies that support modders. I mean, I, did I misunderstand what you said? I mean, I like, I never really got the impression that it was a thing they fully supported. A lot of them but, don't don't try to actively prevent it, but I don't know yeah, that they would it, yeah. that they would no, be I upset mean, it, if if you couldn't do it anymore. Skyrim's a great example. They built an entire modding system at the Skyrim. Okay. Yeah. Um, some, some I haven't games, played Skyrim. So have that's, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, <laughs> I, again, it software did this forever, but um. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of yeah. A lot it, of different it companies always that do allowed this. allowed add-on wads and whatnot. So yeah, yeah. So uh, Valve's games, uh, there's a lot of add-ons. Matter of fact, they open source. They open source the engine. So the source engine. I think, engine, that, I I think the source engine source source is open source. Yeah. Yeah. So so they they went down that avenue, and there's a lot of stuff that's come out since then. Um, uh, surprisingly, um, Skyrim has a, a whole modding section. Um. And, you know, they've to the point where they actually added the ability to put mods, uh, a curated set of them, but they can put mods in the in the Xbox version. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Which is Pretty which cool. is sort of insane. Um, yeah. Especially uh, against pi like piracy and modding usually like don't really go. Well, like I said, it's it's a curated, <laughs> curated set. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to have but the it's game still something and, and it's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so there's there's a bunch that do. I think uh, some of the Fallout games have have modding in them. Um, mm -hmm. So it depends on it depends on the studio. But yeah, you're right. I mean, some of the bigger. Uh, I'm not even sure it's the studios. Honestly, it's, a lot of the publishers are just like, <laughs> forget it. I, I can't even think of good words to use. Um, they, they're just horrible people. <laughs> horrible people. Well, we're bumping up at two hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe we're going to call it a night. There is another article in the show notes about a vulnerability in a VPN uh, yeah, client. I'll, which I'll I... cover this one really quick. Okay. So so uh, a number, uh, about a month, maybe two months ago, um, Pulse Secure had a, a, a major, <laughs> major <laughs> vulnerability in their VPN uh, where it made it like not a VPN. It was like, um, <laughs> like anyway, the opposite uh, of VPN, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, a virtual so public that, network, <laughs> yeah. non-private network. Yeah. So they sent out this alert of like, "Hey, um, you should upgrade because this is bad." <laughs> and um, turns out there's this company, um, uh, a, a travel company, who was like, "No, we don't have to upgrade. 
Um, so they went offline the other day. It's private. Um, it's right there in the name. VPN. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's fine. <laughs> um, so the attack vector was the Pulse Secure VPN, which allowed Weird. the attackers to get onto the network. Weird. At which point the attackers went, ooh, ransomware. Uh, of course. To my knowledge, what they're else are they still down. Do? Yeah, to my knowledge, they're still down. The attackers are demanding uh, $3 million in Bitcoin. <laughs> and if they don't get it, they're going to release uh, the credit card. Is this the point where they capsize all the oil people. tankers? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're going to release all of the personal details, including credit card numbers of the people that have used the travel agency. Oh wow! Um, and this is Bomber. this is a yeah. big company. So this isn't this isn't just ransomware. Like we've got all no. your data. This is no. ransomware. No, this like... is this is ransomware plus. This is blackmailware. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, blackmail. Clearly, the company they've was invented a things. new avenue. <laughs> Clearly, this company was storing things in a Clear way that they text? should not have. Yeah, there's like a text <laughs> file on someone's desktop where they keep all yeah, this stuff sounds, for easy access. If That's if terrible. this stuff goes public, it sounds like a company might be going out of business as GDPR comes and slaps them a little bit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> right, right. And I'm sure, I'm sure they have like you, uh, you know, citizens in their database. It's like, well, it's 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 a it's not a U.S. company. It's it's somewhere in Europe, I believe. Um, yeah, but I mean, any traveling agency will probably have like international people from all over the world. You would think. Yeah, yeah. this is some sort of uh, worldwide money. It's got TravelX. Some sort of I, I. You know what? I would tell you what they do, except that their website is down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Weird. Why is their website down? There's this <laughs> huge message here about how all of their stuff. They, they got a software virus, and as oh. a cautionary measure, they took everything offline. A software virus. I, 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 I just, in, like, you know, like I just, they didn't, I, they didn't get like a biological virus, and they're all just all in this. Clearly. They're all just like in the yeah. bathroom right but now. But it's, it's okay. You can call them on the telephone and give them your money. They're, they're totally up to keeping your money, to taking your money. I, I still don't get how in 2019 this ransomware is still a thing with stored snapshots, and you know, like. So many, well, because things that allow you to refer, to easily or like tape backups. Yeah, I get it. You like you got to be down for a cu- for a couple of days. Backups like paying the ransom. Backups are, and I'm <clears throat> sure you're aware of this. Backups are the thing that you <clears throat> only care about when you need them, and when you don't need them, they just cost a lot of money, or they're a hassle, or they cost you time, or whatever. I mean, I, I just went through this myself when I when I stopped working at an office uh, where I was keeping my backup, which was basically just a hard drive I had on my desk in my office uh, where I would mm-hmm. take my laptop to every so often and let it back up. Um, I went I went two months with no actual offsite backup and I'm like, you know, this is bad. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So I, I really like thought about how how do I how do I make this happen in a way that I'm not going to give up on it because it's a hassle, right? Like, I could have just kept on going the same thing except taking that extra hard drive to my dad's house, right? Mm-hmm. But I know that three weeks in, I would forget to take it to my dad's house, and then it would never happen again, right? So, like, backups are inconvenient, and they're only useful when you really need them. So yeah. I can I can easily understand why, especially <clears throat> small businesses, are falling to this because we had to so, fight... Yeah, small- Small businesses like can't afford to buy like a SAN for you know fifty a hundred thousand dollars, but like this is a huge company. Yeah, uh, but well, because huge companies like this fall into a different problem. So they realize the purpose of backups, and they do backups, and then they go, "But wait, if I have everything set up to be HA, I, <laughs> I don't won't need backups, backups anymore." Right. Yeah. So now everything is connected. Ransomware comes in. And ransomware's everything, the live site and the HA site, yeah. and then they go, "Yep, oh, I didn't think of that." That's, that's what backups are for. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. And I mean, even it doesn't matter how small or large the company is, unless they understand the value of backups, it is just an expense to some to some you know. Oh, budget, that's definitely like, budget yeah, person that's uh, up the line from you. Hmm. you know? Especially if you get like somebody that's like 
the CTO of a company and so it's like that doesn't know anything about computers that yeah. never happens. I mean, it's, it doesn't even have to be that, right? So in the at, at at and and Jason, you were there when this when this occurred. The two of us, when we used to work together in higher ed, um, we had a backup array that you know someone had put money into at some point, and it was like seven eight years old, and disks were dying in it, and and like the mm -hmm. the, the backup administrator was just like on edge trying to make sure that this thing was working properly. Uh, because he knew the importance of the backups. We all knew the importance of the backups, but nobody would spend money on replacing the damn thing. <laughs> because it's like, well, we have backups. Why would and, we spend money on that again? <laughs> yep, and he fought tooth and nail for yeah. years until he finally got the new backups. I have no idea what happened because I've, I've been out of there since, but he got his new backup system. Yep. And I, I mean, I hope he got it running. <laughs> he did, yeah. Okay. It's well, probably still running good. today. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, he they, they he finally got them to spend money on it, and and uh, you know, we had backups again. But but the, but you know, we're not talking about a small place. We're talking yeah. about like a, a a large place with <clears throat> a, a lot of important data that they didn't want to lose, but they wouldn't put money into backups. Yeah, or a lot of times, like people put the backups in Active Directory. So if like the ransomware racks yeah. you or like everything, it also encrypts your backups, so your backups are useless. Yeah. Or or they're like <laughs> a they're they're like a SIF share somewhere. I, I have a second yeah. copy of my data, therefore it's a backup. Yeah, but it, it was mounted on the server that got ransomware, and it got <laughs> ransomed along with it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, you should be following what is what is the uh, the three two one principle? Yeah, three backups, exactly. two two separate locations, and at least one of them is offline. Yeah, mm -hmm. or one yeah. of them's off site is the word I've uh, uh, what I've yeah. heard. I also yeah, like the uh, like the solutions like uh, Veeam and uh, like more companies are doing that now, where you can like run a, like you back up a VM and you can run your v your VM from the backup. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you can you can schedule jobs that will start VMs in like the sort of a bubble network to test that your backups actually work. Yep. Mm. And imaging like that has a lot of other useful things like yeah. unit tests and whatever. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that, that article we were going to skip, we just now talked <laughs> 15 minutes about. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> More Welcome information. Iron Sysamin. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how it goes here in Iron <laughs> Sysamin. All right. So I think that's it. We're going to call it a night. Um, a lot of interesting things we talked about tonight. <laughs> All right, so uh, roughly the second and fourth Thursday of every month, you guys can listen to us. Uh, sometimes we're live. I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about what to do about live streaming. Um, it may become, may, may become a patron-only thing. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag of that. Maybe I'll delete that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, you can find uh, video recordings of our podcasts on YouTube, youtube.com slash iron sysadmin podcasts. And if we do do public streams, that's where they're going to be. You can join our Slack workstation workspace if you go to iron sysadmin.com forward slash Slack. It'll take you to a uh, invite link that you can join our Slack workspace. I should probably test that and see if it still works. We haven't had any new, any new members lately. Um, on Let the, me test it out for you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. On the socials, you can find us uh, Facebook and Twitter. You can find us as Iron Sysadmin. And you can subscribe to us pretty much wherever you would find podcasts normally. And, of course, if you would like to donate to the show via Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash Iron Sysadmin. And that, I think, is a wrap for tonight. Any closing comments from anybody? Stay safe. Stay safe. Long and, bash. and power shell all the and things. power shell. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Good night. Good night.